There you go. Yeah, so the title changed a couple of times. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I realize you guys have uh, literally hundreds of places you could be or would probably rather be, so I appreciate that you uh, showed up to uh, join me for the next hour. Uh, just kidding about the title, by the way. Just uh, wanted to troll the conference a little bit. So um, in 2013, I did this speech at DLD Digital Life Design Conference in Munich, where I basically stayed up all night and wrote down everything I thought that was really interesting, that was changing the world through the fundamental shift of analog data towards digital. So a few years ago, not a big news, you know, less analog, more digital, but it turned out to be a pretty popular shtick and sort of made its rounds on YouTube. And so I decided, well, why not? I'm in Texas, South by Southwest. I will stay up all night and write down what today makes me think of, hey, these are important trends. Maybe people are seeing them. Maybe they're not. Maybe I'm completely wrong. But I'm here to share with you what I think is going on in the world that's going to matter. So I picked out a few uh, images to illustrate my thoughts. Um, I actually completely randomly pulled them out of Google. Some of these are copyright of their respective owners. Please respect the owners and um, thank you. So l let's go. Uh, I have no idea how long this goes. I literally did stay up all night writing this down. So if I run out of material, I encourage you to ask me questions. The good thing is that if you're bored, I can't see you anyway. So if you're playing with your phone, if I see you, I think you're typing in a question with Ask Max tag. And if I don't see you, great. So. I've done this for about 20 years, being an entrepreneur, and the number one question people ask me is, hey, I have this really cool idea. Can you help me figure out that, you know, if this is going to work out of the company? Would you trust that guy? Sort of a, I'm second from, uh, from left, I think. Um, I shaved my head that day. You can sort of imagine what was really happening beforehand. So, you know, I, I honestly don't have a crystal ball, and I really don't know if anyone does, so anybody, somebody tells you this will always, this is guaranteed to fail or this is guaranteed to succeed, don't trust them for a second. You know, number one advice as an entrepreneur that I've ever gotten and given is go for it. If you're going to start a company, do it tomorrow morning. So this is all disclaimers built in. Of course, the number one success factor in my entire career is luck. That does not mean bet it all on black. Just uh, you know, know that uh, even the very best ideas fail. Even the stupidest ideas sometimes wind up becoming billion dollar companies. But I do have a sort of quasi-scientific method that I use um, with my team to figure out where to look. It's really important to look for things, to me anyway, that matter. I, on the side, I have this sort of a idea incubator for myself called HVF, Hard Valuable Fund. Those are the three criteria that I use to figure out if it's worth doing. And spotting problems that are difficult and meaningful enough in the world that I'm personally passionate about is kind of the formula of HVF. How do we go? about figuring this out. So I, I uh, well, before, actually, before I, I try to explain the, the, the scientific method, let's agree that we're only going to look for really big ideas. The thing that has been frustrating me probably that, that stopped or slowed down in my permanent sense of frustration, not just because I've been up all night, that um, people seem to have been really focused on solving really small problems. And I think solving a really small problem in a really small industry in a really small segment of it is just boring. Like, why would you go and bet it all on black, throw your lot in with another person just to start a company that ultimately has a very limited window of opportunity? So going for big ideas, things that actually make you scared, things that, you know, if, if I don't build it, it's going to eat me up. The responsibility and the possibility is overwhelming. So if we don't build it, who will sort of is, is, is the kind of ideas that I'm trying to look for using this approach. So when I think about looking for company ideas, I try very hard not to look for company ideas. What I look for is what I call a wave or a trend. And this is sort of the, the wave spotting device. I have no idea what it's called, but it's a cool picture. Um, the, Wave, what I mean by wave is it's a secular change that is happening so strongly, it has such a massive impact on everything around us that you either write it or you get swept up in it. And you just kind of take advantage of it if you can as an entrepreneur. The trick is you have to spot it when it's a tiny little swell. You know, when, when you already know, it, you know it's, it's no big news that we're basically all going to use our mobile phones from now till the end of the world, until the new big disruption comes. But noticing that a lot earlier would have been pretty 
was pretty valuable for a lot of people, as we'll talk about in a second. So if you spot the swell and predict that the wave is really gonna go big, you wanna get your board out and, and try to go for it. I am not a surfer, incidentally, so I have no idea what I'm talking about, but you know, I think writing the big wave is kind of the dream of every entrepreneur. You latch onto a giant trend and you build something really profound, really important, something that hopefully impact the world for the better. So that was my point about, uh, you know, you, if you saw that, this is, this is actually a cheap imitation of the original as seen on Gordon Gecko, full 20 years prior to this one. But you know, the Luke Mom no wires should have been, for some people, a pretty good predictor of this. And uh, out of that, that, and if you could see it, your name is Steve Jobs. And uh, I salute you because well, you're Steve Jobs and you're awesome, but also if you saw that too, hopefully you build a company around that notion as well. Question is, could you have predicted the brick on your face version of the same idea? <laughs> I have no idea. I, I, have the, I have said brick on my desk. I still am trying to figure out how to use it, but I'm confident AR and VR are a fairly important trend, not covered in this presentation. It's, it's well covered in other places. So, actually I'm lying. There's a little bit of, about that later. So. Let's, uh, let's go back to the, to the crystal ball. Um, so there are four waves that I will cover. It doesn't mean that these are my favorite or that they are in any order of priority. It's what, you know, the best I could come up with in my hotel room. Um, by the way, if you take one of these things and you take it to the moon, please let me invest in my copious spare time when I'm not running a company called Affirm. I also do a little bit of startup investing, and that concludes the commercial presentation. So you're probably thinking, what, what the hell is this word? It's actually a real word, although not every spell checker will, uh, will, will catch it. So it's a real new trend. Not every spell checker has this in its database. You're probably thinking of something like this that is not the same thing. It's kind of the opposite. That is a Disney movie. Nothing to do with uh, beneficence, and uh, I will define it for you. It's actually sort of an obvious thing. Vast majority of businesses in America worldwide are basically built with the customer in mind. You're trying to do good things, trying to actively have a warm, fuzzy, good relationship with your customer. It's obvious, it should be everywhere. In fact, free market forces will just fix that. If you have an evil company trying to take advantage of its customers, it'll just get run over by the good competitor. Turns out it is not always the case. Remember the South Park episode? And it's gone. I was going to show it to you guys, but it's about 15 minutes long. It's really vulgar. I wasn't briefed on whether it's okay to curse from the stage. But this is the uh, video about the evil banker taking all of Stan's money, depositing it into the mutual market, money market, mutual fund money market account, and it's gone in less than uh, 15 seconds. It was all gone. And this is basically a funny but extremely descriptive summary of broad American perception, certainly young Americans' perception of their banks. This came out in 2009. Where'd it go? Bring back my slide. It's funnier with it. So the country woke up one morning and realized that the cornerstone of American economy, the bank, the sort of a beautiful structure that, you know, with marble and the high ceilings, wasn't actually looking out for their good. In fact, they were trying to line their own pockets and wound up taking a lot of the consumer's money with it as they were failing. So beneficence was certainly not top of mind. I had a whole bunch of other really cool images like the fat cat banker, but I skipped on that. So you could sort of tell they weren't looking out for you because if you read the fine print, which I don't encourage you to read, you'll destroy your eyesight, you would see that in there somewhere it says it is really 0% financing until you miss your first payment. And when you do, the interest goes to the maximum allowed by law, and it compounds from the day of purchase with a late fee included. And so if you sort of really dug into it and realized that the issuing bank of your credit card is actually telling you, we are going to screw you given the very first chance we get, you would probably not take out the credit card, but the, uh, the company in question wasn't as good about being transparent. And so sort of have this, the consequences of a small mistake sometimes gets people into what's known as the permanent debt spiral. It's well covered in other sources. One good stat from 2008-2009, many of such financial products made 40% of the profits from late fees. That is a good example of not beneficence. I'm not sure even Maleficent, Maleficence, whatever that movie is, is the opposite, but uh, that would be that in my book. And so um, 
after 2008, it became really hard to not be beneficent because many, many other industries have already settled into this mode where you have to be good to your customer because if you're not, you're going to get laughed at and then run out of town. Thanks to Twitter, Facebook, and all the other social media systems, it's gotten a lot harder even for the complicated ones like finance, except there really hadn't been that much done. So several years ago, I decided, hey, there's an opportunity to build the very first truly beneficent financial institution, the one that actually looks out for its customers. So can you go into a bank and fix it? And it uh, turns out that you could with technology, but the banking technology is fairly well illustrated by what looks like a, I believe this is a telephone pole in uh, Mumbai. It's hard to upgrade. It's not really clear where you start. You need a revolution, which, uh, you know, any chance I get, I will, uh, I will throw my lot into revolution. Um, so back to uh, chest beating and self-promotion. A few years ago, four years ago, I decided to start a company with a couple of friends, going back to what turned out to be my first success, my unrequited or somewhat requited love of financial technology. And a firm really is, the goal is to come back and fix what we left unfixed back in the early days of PayPal. It was actually a very, very simple idea. Just, well, what if we do what banks do, but made it exceedingly transparent? And we really focused on just a very simple product, lending, buying, point of sale finance, the things that the decision you make when you look at something that says 0% financing and you know it's out there to bite you and screw you in the end. But what if we ripped all the curtains off? What if we sort of dusted off the, the dust and told you exactly what it would cost in dollars, in cents, with extreme clarity? Just sort of this really idealistic view of the world, be beneficent and see what happens. And it took off like wildfire. It took about three and a half years for it to take off like wildfire, actually. It was really slow going, and we sort of thought it was going to fail many, many times. But uh, it did take off because eventually people started telling each other that there's this one financial services company that is irrevocably committed to doing the right thing by its customers, even if it means making less money, which is fundamentally what beneficence as a trend is all about. And I predict to you there'll be many, many industries where the reason there hasn't been a fundamental internal disruption is because the capitalist equilibrium has created a situation, if you will, where maximum profitability, which is in the interest of the shareholders of the company, does not immediately result in the best possible outcome for the user. These are not super common, but they're typically huge. If you think through insurance, if you think through finance, if you think through healthcare, if you think through energy, impact on the environment, et cetera, you will find pockets of gigantic industries where maximizing profit is fundamentally not so good for the underlying user of the technology of the company. And with the spotlight of social media on you, if you are the first to go in and say, I will do what's right, I will do what's great for the user, I think you'll actually take a lot of market share away from the incumbents. So your wave number one, and uh, if you're gonna think about finance, don't go there, I'm gonna go fix that, but you're welcome, lots of, lots of the other ones. <laughs> Kidding, there, there's so much of consumer and business finance available, please everybody come and fix that. So on to my, my trend, my wave number two. So right now we're spending a lot of time thinking and talking about AI, and. Uh, some of my former compatriots are busy freaking out about uh, AI taking over and going on always Skynet on us. But um, I'm not too worried about it. Most of the time when I think about AI, I think of kind of the Siri, Echo, Hal, Jarvis, Marvin, basically stupid, confused, slightly helpful when asked nicely and clearly articulated. I am not yet worried, but just in case, I welcome our new robot overlords, just, just <laughs> as a hedge. However, um, I think it's actually going to flip around really, really, really soon. So, yeah, you're welcome to read that. It's pretty cool. Um, I think the, <laughs> there'll be a massive shift in the way we think about AI. Today, AI is this thing that we call upon when we're confused, when we need some help. It's going to change where AI is actually going to be performing vast majority of the intellectual, deeply intellectually demanding routines, services, and we will be on the standby helping Siri decide when something actually is outside of her set of understanding, when she needs an intuition as opposed to inference. And computers are going to get better and better at inference. It's going to be a while, which is why I'm not too worried about the robot overlords just yet, before computers get to real 
sense of intuitive, sort of the gut feel that humans are so proud of. Although Go is a game of gut feel, and apparently that's been taken away from us as well. So long, Team Humanity. I am rooting for the robot overlords on that one. So if you consider medicine, this is actually a perfect example. So today, we have a supercomputer in our back pockets. I have one right now, and if I am you know, feeling uh, sniffles, I can call my doctor and tell him, yeah, I'm feeling terrible, you know, what do you think? That's a fairly pathetic use of a massive computing device, right? So you know, we're talking about all these really great technologies we can put to work. We're expecting augmented reality. I'm a big fan of augmented reality, not so much virtual reality. Virtual reality is basically, as far as I'm concerned, a training ground. You're not really changing the world. Augmented reality is where you get smarter, acquire skills, become more intelligent, hopefully by an order of magnitude, because you have access to all the information while looking at the real world. And so that's what we think. That, that's AI on standby. You got 20% more smarts, 20% more skills. I think that's completely wrong. Here, here's what I think should really happen. So if you do a lot of this, this is me, by the way, if you can tell, uh, you wind up with a lot of that. This is uh, you know, the inevitable consequence of being a competitive cyclist is you uh, crash and you have road rash. I carved out all the really gnarly parts, so I hope this doesn't gross you out too much. So I basically spend my Saturday afternoons texting my doctor pictures of my boo-boos that occurred on Saturday mornings. And most of the time, he just tells me to toughen up. But that's a huge waste of computing power, right? What I really want is an app where I take a photo and a whole bunch of doctors worldwide vote on whether this is a real problem or I should just man up or get stitches. Once I have a whole bunch of those doctors and a whole bunch of those votes from a whole bunch of those images, I have a learning set. And what I really want is a machine that tells me that is, in fact, fairly bad. You know, get yourself to ER. Your uh, clavicle is uh, out of whack, just like the, the left one is still from the last crash. And uh, that's when it flips around. You have AI basically diagnosing you. And when the vote between multiple AIs is a tiebreaker, you involve a human. That's when my doctor will get a text asking, hey, you know, we can't figure this one out. What do you think? So I predict this will be an enormous trend where we're going to push a ton of inference into the hands of computers and finally become comfortable with that idea with humans as the final resolver of the, you know, we can't quite figure it out what's going on. On to the uh, trend number three. So my friend and uh, former, not really classmate, we overlapped at the University of Illinois by a couple of years, Mark Andreessen said, software is eating the world. I think it's more like software is digesting the world. And at this point, there's really not a lot left that isn't powered by software, isn't automated by software, isn't sort of fundamentally changed by software. But the good news is that there's a whole bunch of people that think they're safe. Any never-ending story fans here? It would have been too obvious to, to get the original picture out, but that's Ouroboros. All right, never mind. I'm, I'm dating myself rapidly, but uh, that's the snake eating its own head. Software is eating itself. Early adopters get typically enormous gains. They get 10x productivity, gains in value, all, all kinds of really great reasons to be the first person to adopt the newest technology. What typically happens, though, industry participants that decide to go into some brand new trend like software wind up losing out on subsequent innovations because they commit to the first not exactly perfect system. If you look at sort of a, what powers modern banks, it mostly looks like this. The photo is dated, but the technology in it is probably still what your checking account is uh, sitting on top of. So the software is so outdated, people that know how to code are probably dead, literally. And if you look at the uh, job rec list on American Express website, it features exciting opportunities in COBOL and Fortran. I know those, but I grew up in Soviet Union. That was required learning. But uh, I bet you most people that are graduating computer science programs today aren't exactly excited to go upgrade COBOL-laden systems inside America's most loved bank. So huge opportunity. 20-year-old software is basically the same thing as having no software. You could go and find this sort of thing and either replace it or try to upgrade it. Trying to upgrade it is a little bit like saying, let's switch out the engine of a flying aircraft. It would be great, except you might lose all your money, kind of like Stan did in the earlier slide. So the opportunity actually accretes primarily to the disruptor as opposed to the incumbent by nature, even though you're going into an industry where software was supposedly the great enabler 30 years ago and stayed there. It's pretty easy. All you need to do is look for segments where you are so bogged down 
by existing technology, people that are advertising for Fortran, COBOL, languages that are no longer taught in top 20 computer science schools, a great place to start digging for opportunity to build software to eat their software. One interesting idea is that uh, choosing the right ad, which, advertising on the internet, digital advertising, is basically not that different from the medical diagnosis thought experiment that I threw in front of you earlier, and yet ad tech is 10 times better, literally, at customizing what you see than computer is at reading an x-ray. Because x-ray machines, I'm sure you've seen them, have been standardized and built out way, way, way long ago. There's just not enough computing power, et cetera. So tons of opportunity here as far as I'm concerned, and I would love for people here to go dig into that. Um, so last one, this isn't actually the right name for this. Uh, regulatory arbitrage is not what I'm about to tell you about. It's all about avoiding taxes, moving to a different jurisdiction to arbitrage the various comparable rates. It, this is all about using the, exact. so this is not, the regular arbitrage is not what, I, what you think it means, but it'll become apparent. This is about arbitraging changes introduced by the government. And in the last eight years of Obama administration, or seven point something years, and even prior administrations have been fairly active in trying to muscle this country and this economy into reform, into change by way of a law, of law creation, which is great, but inevitably creates dislocations, which if you know where to look, sometimes make enormous opportunities that are not really visible to those that don't dig deep. You'll see that the theme of digging deep is, is sort of common. So, yeah, um, government makes these things happen. This is not the government, but uh, plays one on TV. Um, one way of thinking about it, there are these hidden pools of capital that are available to you either in a form of a subsidy to do something or in the form of a penalty that you can help someone else avoid by producing software and services that will spare them the, uh, the wrath of government. One classic example, my good friend Elon started a company called Tesla. It's a fantastic car. I'm a big fan. It's fundamentally made possible by several things, including advances in battery technology and a bunch of other stuff. But one semi-hidden factor in there, there's an enormous amount of money available from the federal government as they try to subsidize adoption of electric vehicles. May not be the most popular topic in Texas, but it is a fantastically great way of building a business. If you know where to look, there are literally billions of dollars available that lower the cost of adoption for this technology so long as you know where to take advantage of this money. The same, incidentally, is true of solar energy explosion as well, also a passion of Elon's. Um, another one is the uh, Affordable Care Act. There are all kinds of really exciting things written into that particular series of regulations and laws, including penalties for not implementing electronic health records and a variety of other things. There's a clock ticking literally for a whole bunch of medical professionals, eligible professionals, I think they are called in the language of the law. And uh, if your cost of not implementing software is X dollars, surely you're willing to pay someone half X to get you compliant before the deadline strikes. So there's all, all, all sorts of really interesting opportunities and a whole bunch of companies that have been built around that notion. This is not a new idea, but still I day to day run into people that have never heard of the fact that there are literally incentives and financial opportunities inside Affordable Care Act. Mostly they just rag on it, but I think it's an opportunity like any other. Um, so incidentally, inside the Affordable Care Act, just sort of since I'm describing the past but not really offering future advice, there's a whole new thing called meaningful use, and it has these three phases. And I think we're in phase two, but phase three is the really interesting one because it creates what I would consider to be a fundamentally different type of capital pool. It's not a pool of cash per se, it's a pool of data. If you look at meaningful use phase three, it starts requiring various participants in the healthcare ecosystem to share and provide APIs. Literally, the word API is in the language of the law. I'm, I cannot recall anything prior to this one where you can actually see the acronym. Telling health professionals, you have to start sharing this stuff so long as the use on the other side is meaningful because we want more efficient access to healthcare, we want cheaper healthcare, which I think is great. You can get very far just trying to understand what it means to suddenly have access to an enormous amount of medical data. The other sort of completely different example in um, regulatory arbitrage, the way I'm regulatory arbitrage, Richard Nixon style, not, sorry, not Richard Nixon style, that sounds very ominous. The, um, those of you who remember Cryptonomicon, it's a great book that 
weirdly enough, came out right around the time we started PayPal, and first 700 or so pages basically described what we were doing. It was very eerie. But uh, the laws that we are talking about right now, the Apple versus FBI, the computer privacy laws, the data location laws, are going to fundamentally change the economic landscape just the same. You might have to house your servers in a different country. You might have to store your keys in fundamentally different ways. Anytime you see one of those things, a dislocation in what would normally be priced by market, there's typically an area under the curve or below the curve, which is someone's loss or your profit. That's a great place to go look for a thing to do to attack, to start a company. So that's kind of example of what I call rotting capital, basically money that's been left on the table by the government for you to take full advantage of. And uh, what I think is happening, I sort of alluded to this in the meaningful use part, but as the government starts pushing all of us to share data through fiat decisions, through law, depending, independent of which side of that debate you're coming out of, there'll be more and more of this in every imaginable industry. I think you will see a lot more than just healthcare. Again, big industries, energy, food, water, will finally find out a lot of things and will be subsidized by the US government and probably international governments to go attack those problems simply through regulation around data. So I figured this would probably take less time than I have for. One, start thinking about the questions. It'll get very awkward if I'm standing here alone smiling. I'm not, not very social. But uh, I, I did prepare one backup sort of trend to cover. So this is your bonus trend number five. So this is a meta, meta theme, meta wave. It's not actually apropos anything. It's more like how do you think about finding opportunities inside of a theme? Once you've identified, you know, I really want to understand this regulatory arbitrage thing, how to go deep. So the standard sort of a thing, one advice anyway, I don't know if it's standard or not, but a lot of advice that I, I try to dissuade people from taking is the Goldilocks business model. And this one is too small, this one is too large. You, know, you don't really want to start a small company because, well, you know, who needs to run a coffee shop? I'm going to start a really big company because it's overplowed and there's way too many people doing this and big companies are going to compete with you. So start, start one that's just right, the, the, the mid-size startup, and then you know, raise your Series B and we'll figure it out. I think it's total BS. I think what you should do is actually go for a really, really narrow niche in an enormous market. I think that's where the really best ideas ever come from. Uber was initially a New York City service that allowed mere mortals get access to a black car from their phone. You know, that's probably at any given night in New York, several hundred people in New York is one of the largest cities in North America, yet it is now a 60, 70, whatever billion dollar plus company rapidly expanding into all these adjacent segments. So how did it get there? What, what, what is the trick of starting with something super narrow and focused and getting really big? So I have a theory, and this is literally a mental model of how this works, so it might resonate or you might think this is completely bonkers, but for what it's worth. So I, I call this the trend to fractal knowledge, and I think it's kind of fundamentally new way of thinking about information. Um, shout out to my boy Benoit B. Mandelbrot, uh, fractal. Those of you who don't know, Benoit B. Mandelbrot's middle initial B stands for Benoit B. Mandelbrot. Get it? <laughs> Nerds in the audience, excellent. So back to the fractal knowledge. So classically, sort of all through 19th, 20th, whatever century, people, companies expanded by going into a niche saying, you know, I'm going to build some valves. You know, there's this oil industry in Texas. Valves are important. We're going to get a really, do a really good job, a good enough job making a valve, and we're going to start selling them. And they do. If they're successful, they start realizing that valves have to plug into pipes, and you get pretty smart about pipes. And valves are pretty simple, so there's just not that much. You start selling other things. You know, valves are kind of like that. I think that's one of the first patents on the ball valve. I don't think it how it works anymore. I think today, every part of every market, every segment, the largest ones especially, because of software eating the world, because software systems becoming so profoundly important, complexity of every nook and cranny, of every valve, is fundamentally more than the simplicity of you know, ball valves and, and similar things like that. The deeper you go, the more you find out about the opportunity, the more there is to optimize. It's effectively as if you can never get to the simplest possible part. And that's actually the greatest thing because you get so smart about something very, very simple, something very small that the incumbents take for granted that you become an expert and you beat the incumbents at their own game because you can beat them either on cost or on distribution or on value or on price. There are all these different dimensions where being extremely knowledgeable about 
part of a market fundamentally makes you infinitely more competitive. And so the small segment he shows infinitely winds up being a view into an almost infinite world. And then something very magical happens when once you become such a deep of an expert, such a deep expert in a what seemed like a small segment and a big thing, you form a completely different view of the world. You start thinking about the markets, the, the big market that you chose to drill into very deeply as something fundamentally different, not just a valve, but maybe different way of thinking about metals, maybe different way of thinking about manufacturing, different something. But as you have that, you bring a fundamentally fresh ideas that only come with expertise and depth, and then you can really go attack the industry. That's what happened to Uber. They saw a lot of things about human behavior, about usage of phones to schedule transport, and they fundamentally realized that the business really isn't about black cars, it's about logistics. It's about moving people, moving things, moving everything. My, my, my prediction on Uber is extremely bullish, may or may not correlate to the fact that I'm an investor. So this happened to me with a firm. We started out with this really basic idea. Let's just lend money as transparently as possible. Let's make less money by telling people exactly how much money we make and that make people make decisions based on sort of real numbers as opposed to, you know, pitch people on TV, asking them what's in their wallet. And in the process, we learn a lot about technology. We learn a lot about how to underwrite risk. We learn a lot about what people really think of their financial institutions. But we also figured out that the demand for transparent financial services isn't at all limited to lending. It's, in fact, kind of all over the place. And the vision of a firm has morphed from, let's just get the loans exactly right, to let's just get every part of consumer finance fixed. The whole thing is broken. And I don't think from the outside looking in, I could have said, oh, the whole thing is just fundamentally busted. It's only the consequence of being so deep on the inside, the world looks different. Think of it as a prism effect. So either that was a really cool way of thinking about this stuff, or completely obvious. Either way, it gave me a chance to plug my company one last time. So thank you for tolerating that. So a quick recap for you. Beneficence, human-assisted AI, software, eating software, regulatory arbitrage, and uh, fractal knowledge, this way of discovering what to do within these themes. And uh, that's all I got in the prepared remarks. You better have come up with some good questions, otherwise I'm gonna stand here looking very lost. Thank you. All right, uh, you can see the question, so I don't have to read it out loud. Um, but actually might buy me time to read it out loud. Um, why did it take five to 10 years after beneficial technologies viably launched for markets to truly adopt? I think the time to adoption is shrinking. I don't think this is a rule. I think what's really going on is with social media, things are rapidly spread through word of mouth and people start realizing that they don't have to get screwed and then it just changed. How can Silicon Valley companies be most effective in joining the conversation on social justice issues? You know, if, unless you are not paying attention, that's a double negative. If you can notice, a lot of us in Silicon Valley are very openly engaged in these social justice issues, and uh, it seems to, be, uh, seems to be still a fairly hot topic, but it's not really possible to hide from those anymore. I think Silicon Valley produces an incredible amount of value, so it is also to blame for things like income inequality and various other issues. I, we, we have the responsibility to be a participant in the conversation, if not a big part of the solution. You changed your mind on the government Apple case. Why, and what's the future of linear government versus exponential tech? That's a great question. So uh, I tweeted some time ago that, and I got all kinds of flack for it, but I stand by the tweet. I wish I could, uh, actually I don't wish because I don't have the time for it, but I wish somebody could go and have a couple of seminars with our Congress people telling them about how crypto actually works. I have a sinking suspicion, sneaking suspicion? A suspicion that they have no idea. The level of rhetoric around the Apple FBI case and the number of issues that are lumped together is so painfully overbroad that just frustrates someone who has a half way of understanding of what, what the whole thing is really all about. I changed my mind because I'm a father, I'm a patriot. I think hopefully no one in this room could possibly want the government to not have access to terrorist data. Like absent all other concerns, a bucket of dead terrorist data, a agency charged with your safety. 
you want these guys to have this stuff. That, that's fairly obvious, and I wanted to see that happen, and I thought that trumps pretty much everything. I have two little kids, can't wait to see them. The issue at hand is more important than that. That's why I changed my mind. If we're going to have a law, if we're going to have a Supreme Court ruling, if we're going to have Congress pass a law, it doesn't matter how it comes about, that says the following, a tech company can be forced by the government to build new software, to modify its existing software in the hands of consumers that would breach a moral or actual contract of privacy the company has with its user, then the user needs to know this upfront. This cannot happen in a current framework of Fourth Amendment, in my mind, because it's unprecedented. I think it's crucial that this gets discussed publicly. I think it's crucial that Apple takes this all the way to the Supreme Court and or Congress. And if we have a law that says your privacy isn't your own, it's fine. We'll know about it and we'll make appropriate action. But doing this in this sort of, well, it's a little bit like this 19th century law. I think we're, we're not kidding anybody. And I, I decided to stand with, with Tim Cook and, and the rest of the Silicon Valley folks that decided that was the right thing to do. With all that aside, a very, very important thing to separate and understand very clearly. This has little to do, if anything, with the notion of backdooring and building in proactive, as Director Comey of the FBI said, in the design phase, let's solve the key escrow problem. Let's not. Here's what happens if you weaken your security. The good guys that abide by the laws, all of you and me, will have to use crappy security. And that's not going to help us because the bad guys are going to be the first to take advantage of the bad security we're going to have in our iPhones. Bad guys don't have to abide by any law, so they'll just use good security and we won't be able to break in any more than we could in the past. So if you force legally that every system that is sold in America and for expert is backdoored, we're just going to sell crappy systems to ourselves that are gonna be vulnerable. The bad guys are gonna stay with bad systems or with good systems and they're going to be less vulnerable and will be more vulnerable. So Apple issues aside, please don't backdoor my iPhone. Do you think we will need robotic governance? A fact-based discussion about the implications of robotic and AI on, I think we do, I think we already have. Elon and uh, Sam Altman and Reid Hoffman and Peter are all very active in the area. There's tons of things to do to visit, to read online. So I, I think this is firmly happening. All of my sort of a jokery around Skynet coming, et cetera, notwithstanding. I do think it's a very important issue. I think technologically we aren't near it yet, but it is the kind of thing that if it happens, it'll happen very, very quickly. We should at least understand. Incidentally, the solution I think is very simple. You have to invest in open sourced AI. I think if everybody has access to roughly the same level of advances in AI, you'll see exactly the same thing as happened with crypto. It is no longer considered a munition. It's not scary. Everybody understands how it works. This was not always the case. What is the next field we can push AI or augmented reality into? So I'm extremely bullish on both AI and augmented reality for the following reason. I, I don't have a great answer because if I did, I'd probably spin out another company out of HVF yesterday. But what I do think is happening, so there's a lot of people out there justifiably concerned about jobs erosion. And there's certainly jobs are going to immigrants, which you know, certainly I think is in high tech is complete hogwash. I think jobs are going to robots more than anything. And it is a concern. What I think AI and AR will do for us, it will help people without extremely specialized education rapidly acquire skills that will bring them into the 21st, 22nd century worth of needs. If you are a machinist, very soon a robot will do the machining jobs that you are so skilled to do because they are not going to make mistakes. However, it will still require a human to do things like surgery, to do things that require inference, to do things that require intuition. Acquiring the skills to do surgery takes a good doctor 20 odd years. With robotic assistance and AR, you could actually imagine someone with hand-eye coordination and sufficiently high intelligence converting from being a machinist to being a neurosurgeon in a relatively short term. It sounds like complete insanity, I know, but I think that is the best we have as far as transitioning people from effectively blue collar jobs into white collar jobs, so I'm very bullish on that. How effective do you think social media is in accurately credit scoring people? It is not. It is a myth that just won't die. Credit scoring or credit underwriting based on how many friends you have on Facebook has not worked. Hasn't worked for a firm, hasn't worked for anyone I know. It is not how we use our credit scoring technology. We use lots of other data, but it has very little to do with who you are on social media. The interesting thing about social media, it's pretty good about solving another 
problem that comes up in financial services and lending, and that is fraud and identity protection. It is fairly hard these days to create a full-blown online presence that is completely fraudulent. So your Facebook identity is pretty unlikely to be not you. Having said that, there's a whole new class of fraud that's been emerging in online marketplace lending and other ecosystems called synthetic identity fraud, where people literally go through the process of building out a synthetic identity from nothing to social security to marriage certificate to Facebook page to LinkedIn profile to a resume. It's pretty unbelievable. And those are extremely valuable. They're essentially sort of spy identities used to borrow money and never pay it back. So it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. What will happen to companies like Yelp that appear to have issues around trust and authenticity as they continue to rely on data? That's right into the crystal ball bucket. I don't know if I can predict what will happen to Yelp. In fact, I cannot since until recently I was a chairman of the company. But I think authenticity and trust will start where we have been rapidly gaining as a very, very important dimension in which companies need to think about themselves and which they have to measure their performance. And if you're planning to kind of ignore it and just deliver pure shareholder value, it is probably not going to be enough. What is your prediction for fundraising in 2016? That is another thing that's really hard to predict. It does appear that the most recent market fluctuations have caused all kinds of unicorns to get much closer to being unicorpses, which is probably not the worst thing in the world. For some of them, it's also a problem for, for others that are legitimately going to go raise money and hear from their prospective investors, well, look at the market, everything's 40% down, you should take a down round. And no matter how much you beat your proverbial chest about how well you've done since the last round, people compare you to what's known as public comps. I think it's gonna be a fascinating year in venture capital. I think inherently anytime you have high volatility, you will wind up with deals, as in people will see value in investments that would have been previously overpriced. So as an investor, I'm sort of sharpening my pencil, looking for really great ideas that are having a hard time raising money. It's also going to help companies like Affirm, frankly, that are kind of mid-stage to growth stage, acquire some of these companies that have been underfunded or overfunded and cannot raise their next round of financing. So in general, I sort of welcome the market correction, although it certainly caused a fairly turbulent ride in the first part of January. And I imagine there's more to come. The general consensus among my Wall Street investing friends is that there's more turbulence to be had versus less. How do we better define the value exchange of ad revenue and content for consumers? That's a pretty interesting topic in general. There was an article more than a decade ago I think it's called Infomediaries, or the, I think that, that was called, and if I remember, it was either in Wired or the Upside Magazine. And it basically postulated this notion that at some point there'll be companies that will collect your personal data, package it up, sort of anonymize it just enough, and sell it on your behalf to advertisers so that you can get content for free and they can target you so precisely according to your needs and wants that the exchange will be super efficient, everybody makes a little bit of money, and it'll be great. It didn't really work out that way at all. In fact, all the companies that were founded around this notion of intermediary, on my, to my knowledge, have generally gone the way of the dodo, except, of course, for Google, that takes your searches, which is basically your proprietary data. You whisper into Google, I have a boo-boo, do I need stitches? Google knows a lot about you from that point on, and they keep a lot of that together. So, Defining the value exchange, we may have already defined it. I think it might be somewhere between page rank and cost, you know, pay, cost per click. How do we stop benefic misspelled, beneficent companies being brought by larger companies, being bought by larger companies to maximize profits? Isn't this happening all the time? You know, grow a pair and say no. If you're really committed to what it is you're doing and why you're doing it, compete. You don't, you know, the, uh, one of the things, incidentally, hopefully most people here are nonplussed, let's say, by the current presidential race dynamics. And uh, Obama's presence here yesterday, notwithstanding, it was sort of the, the outgoing president certainly remains a picture of what it means to be classy. The uh, incoming president's presidential candidates, I'm not convinced about that. I once complained to a Republican friend of mine that to sort of, now that I've gave, given Obama a compliment, I will, I will admit to being very scared of him when he was campaigning. I came from Soviet Union as a kid. I saw what socialism looks like. The notion of redistribution of wealth freaked the hell out of me. And when Obama said, you didn't build the internet, and I said, oh crap, this guy is gonna do exactly what I saw as a teenager. Only those doing the redistribution are gonna get rich. Everybody else is gonna get screwed. 
I was whining about this to a friend of mine who's a died in the world Republican and said, I told him, look, I, I, I might like go somewhere. Maybe I'll go to New Zealand or something. And he said, no, you're not. Stay and fight. <laughs> so I can't pretend to figure out, and I necessarily don't necessarily agree with him, certainly agree with him infinitely less now, but if you are being bought for all the wrong reasons by not beneficent companies, somebody who wants to maximize profits and doesn't care, wants to steamroll their consumers, stay and fight. Just do the right thing. What do you think about cross-border e-commerce? Go back, Ryan. I think that was the question. Um, cross-border e-commerce is great. Anytime, I'm a big fan of uh, anything cross-border. Anything that cr has inherent inefficiency is an opportunity. So anytime you can spot something that's like, whoa, that's out of whack, it's way cheaper here, that, that's how majority of business was built. As a part of identity management and fraud prevention, what other services aside from lending can new 2.0 fintech firms provide? Get the brochure in your bank that lists out their services. I assure you, every single one of them can be provided by FinTech 2.0. Mortgage servicing. There are all kinds of esoteria in the world of just, if you took 15 minutes to understand how credit card processing works, you will find that even if you're in the credit card business, back to my fractal knowledge point, there is so much to learn. Like those of you who think that you know exactly how credit card processing works, think through the notion of routing a card based on bin at the point of sale, who controls that? Is that controlled by the merchant acquirer? Is that controlled by the terminal manufacturer? Is that controlled by the merchant? Who can get paid to make sure that transaction goes to a different place? Just thinking about that and the inefficiency of that system should give you a sense that even something as basic and as revolutionized as credit card processing at the point of sale, PayPal has kind of figured this out 15, 17 years ago, tons more inefficiency remaining. So from mortgages to student loans, which is a whole new host of problems, to non-qualified mortgages, which are coming and are gonna be extremely interesting because people need to buy houses even if they cannot sell their loan to Freddie and Fannie. I think the supply of problems to solve in FinTech is infinite. I think it's the single second largest industry in the world after energy, if memory serves, so there's, there's a lot of opportunities. What type of education do you wish for your children, the kind that makes them human? I think uh, the one thing that I, I'm, I'm very aware of, you know, if, if you're, uh, somebody gave this advice to me when I had my first kid, or my wife had our first kid, and I was standing by boiling water, um, <laughs> which is a great way to keep, keep the, uh, the, the non-performing parent busy in the, um, in the birth process. I asked, you know, what do I do? How do I make sure this kid, I, I grew up in a sort of what I thought was fantastic surrounding Soviet upbringing I was standing. I had scientists all around me. I was busy learning languages and math and chess and all this amazing stuff. My, my childhood was, was pretty awesome. And I asked a friend who had grown up kids, hey, how do you, you know, who, whom I thought, who I thought were pretty fantastic children, like, how did you do this? Like, what, what was the formula? Because I didn't really have a chance to ask my parents about that. And um, he said, you know, when you're wondering whether to schedule soccer or the chess team for the four o'clock slot, you're fine. Like, they're, they're gonna be okay. You're participating in their life and they'll figure it out whether they want soccer or chess later on. The thing you need to worry about is if they grow up human, do they understand the world they live in? Can they look around and identify and empathize and commiserate with people around them? Not everyone is privileged, not everyone is like you. Just worry about them not being too far away from their peer group, that's all you have to worry about. And so that, that's the education that, that I really want to have happen to them if they wind up Becoming chess masters, great. I'm certainly competitive enough to uh, crush my six-year-old in chess every evening. <laughs> Did I outpace the question supply? <laughs> Aha. I think I have. Excellent. All right, uh, it is uh, 11 minutes left on the clock. If you want to yell out a question, I will take it. But one, I can see a person go. I have no idea what the future is for anything, but the future of blockchain, so it is the most abused, eh, it's a good question. I actually, I, I don't want to dismiss it. So one of the things that I did when the original Satoshi paper came out, my background is in number theory and the, the kind of math that powers crypto. So when it came out, I was like, ah, oh, Byzantine general problem has been solved, whatever, man. And then you should read it, somebody said. And so I read the paper and like, holy shit, it actually, is a solution and it's elegant. And I read it several times throughout the same night. You can tell sort of by my propensity to stay up all night is kind of how I get things done. 
I was blown away. The math is beautiful. It is a really clever use of Merkle trees, and it's just all kinds of awesome, and I loved it, and I really wanted it to be successful. And it also was an exercise in kind of a crowdsourced technology, governance, design, currency control, all kinds of amazing stuff, because Satoshi took himself out of the spotlight, and this team of core developers was basically navigating the complexity of miners and all the other participants in the ecosystem, and it's breaking down. If you look at what's going on right now, I haven't been sort of on the forums in the last 48 hours since I've been traveling around Texas, but last I checked, the whole place is decohering into a bunch of people pounding their chest and saying, this is the white one and only right way, and other people saying, no, 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 our way is the only one, and you should, uh, to the other people, you, you should stop doing it wrong. So at the moment, I'm very bearish on Bitcoin as a universal currency, and I've certainly been bearish on it as an asset class for a long time because it's been, for a while, going up too fast and going down too quickly, and that has been stuck in 450 or something like that for a very long time. So as a theoretical tool for good, something that could create self-enforcing contracts, something that could power disruption in notarization, which is an outdated ancient industry on which we all rely every time we buy a house, for example, or, or any other form of contract. I think blockchain is the most unbelievably useful technology that ever come about. I think the vision that Satoshi sort of painted in the original paper, and that is building the universal currency with inherently deflationary characteristics to insulate it from all kinds of problems that we are seeing in the world today, has failed so far. And I hope there's some sort of a turnaround, but I'm unfortunately not particularly bullish on it. All right, I will return eight and a half, 8.2 minutes of your time to you. Thank you very much for listening to me rant. Thank you.